Our next presenter is Dr. Stephanie Freiberg. She is the Associate Professor of American Indian Studies and Psychology at the University of Washington. She focuses on how social representation of race, culture, and social class influence the development of self, psychological well-being, physical health, and educational attainment. She brings to today's program a much needed perspective on how culture and culture mismatches play into our work. In high demand for her expertise, Steph is one of the hardest working professors I have ever met. So please, would you give it up, Dr. Stephanie Freiberg. Well, thank you for having me here today. I'm delighted to be here. And I want to start by talking just a little bit about what I do in a bigger picture, um, but in part because I want to help situate you in thinking both about what I mean by culture, but more importantly, in thinking about what it means in the work that you do and the work that I want to do both as a researcher, but also as a researcher who likes to implement. And so when I think about my work, the way that I describe what I do is I like to make the invisible visible. So I think a lot about situations and how different individuals walk into situations and how we take some things for granted and how that person is met by that situation. So as a social psychologist, I study the person in situation. And most of my work centers on the idea that the problem is not in the individual, but in the situation. And that when we change the power of the situation, right, when we acknowledge how powerful the situation is, we have the ability to change it in ways that can benefit people who are historically underserved by the good work that we do. And so as someone who has spent most of my career focusing in particular on low income and minority children in schools, right, there's so much about school that is such a powerful space. There's so many subtle ways in which we push children out and, and little, I mean, very little ways, these little subtle things that we do. And that's the power of culture and so today, I want to start by talking a bit about what I mean by identity safe spaces and then what I mean by culture. So an identity safe space is a space that communicates to all people that they belong and that they can be successful in that context. They are spaces that promote culture congruent models of self, and I'm, I'm going to define that in a second. Spaces free from stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. And some of those prejudices are things that are not obvious to us. They're these little things about how people talk, or how people ask questions, or how they try to relate to you. Because people actually walk through the world, right? they develop a sense of self that defines how they understand connecting with you. And then finally, spaces that include positive and inclusive representations of diversity. And so as a Native person, right, this is something where I think both about what is presented and what's not presented. So as a contemporary Native person, we are almost always missing from contemporary spaces. And yet we're not missing. It's as though the modern form of discrimination against Native people is invisibility. We just pretend like we don't exist. We pretend like we existed in the 18th and 19th century, and not now. But as the mother of two children, I think all the time about what it means for my children to grow up in a world where they don't see themselves represented. And so the power of those representations lies both in how we represent what is good and what's missing from what is good. And so when I talk about culture, I'm talking both about the things that we see, the things, how we dress, what we eat, right? Those things are features of culture, but more importantly, it's the implicit pieces of culture that I'm interested in. 
So culture consists of explicit and implicit patterns of historically derived and selected ideas and their embodiment in institutions, practices, and artifacts. It's the acknowledgement that culture doesn't exist in here. Culture exists in the space between us. And as we engage those spaces, some spaces and some people have more power to define that space. And so as a cultural being, I only know what I know. So the, the background that I have, the places I grew up in, I can only know what I know. And so when I hear a teacher berate a child for not knowing the right way to behave, or worse, because the child brought chips and a soda for lunch, but it was the only thing in their house, or the, the adult who tells a child, oh, but you can be so much more than a fisherman, but that child's father was a great fisherman. And so when we don't think beyond right, that initial impression, we risk telling children, you know what? Your hopes, your dreams, they don't matter. They're not important. They're not valued here. But what's amazing is that we do it to adults too. And so many of the people in this room I can only assume, right, have figured out how to, how to walk your way through those mainstream cultural contexts. And for some of you, they felt right, right? It matched, it was who you were. Some of you grew up knowing you'd go to college. I thought the University of Washington was a football team. <laughs> I'm not joking, it was, it was what we watched on Saturdays in my house. And out on the reservation, Football and sports are everything. So that idea when I got to be 18 that I should go to college wasn't even a thought. I was fifth in my class in Marysville. And not even a thought that I should go to college. And so right, there was sort of an assumption on the part of teachers and counselors that of course I would go to college. But again, you only know what you know. Nobody in my family, my entire family, had ever gone to college. And being a native person living on the reservation, when I say family, I'm talking about a lot of people, <laughs> okay? And nobody I had ever known had gone to college. So it wasn't even a thought in my mind that that was a possibility. It also wasn't a thought in my mind that I would go to college and do something for myself. So the other big thing as an adult that kept happening is that as I struggled to adjust to the college environment, people kept saying to me, the problem is, I love when people start a statement that way, <laughs> right? The problem is that you don't know what you want. You don't know what you like. You have to have goals. What do you want? But I had grown up in a world where it wasn't about me. I had grown up in a world where it was about fitting in and being part of a larger unit. And so in my mind, I kept thinking, how is this college going to help my community? I don't see the connection. And so the unhappiness came from the fact that I was both disconnected from the people that I had, had grown up with, but disconnected in a more interdependent way, where my understanding of what it meant to be a person was to be in relationship. And then I couldn't see how this next step was going to help my community. And so, right, but what people were saying to me, it wasn't helping. It kept making me think, oh, so I really shouldn't be here, right? This is not the place for me. And I just kept hanging out. Maybe I was a little uncertain. Right? I wasn't really sure, but I hung around long enough that at every juncture, I found one person who I connected with. And because of that person, I stayed. And I want you to think about, I hadn't intended to, to bring that story up, but I, I'm trying to connect these really subtle aspects of culture in a way that I want to bring to light for you. Because in the intervention work we've done, both with adults and with children, it all boils down to these subtleties in the environment. 
And so cultural systems may on one hand be considered as products of action and on the other as conditioning elements of further action. So I grew up in a context. I learned a particular way of being, right? So I was a product of the environments that I grew up in. But once I act in the world, I either reinforce that cultural way of being or I begin to change it. Now surprisingly, few people actually work to change cultural environments. Because it's so invisible to us, we do what we do and we don't think about it. But that is truly the power of culture. And so today I want to talk about the culture cycle. And if you come to my workshop this afternoon, I'm going to talk about some of the work we've done instituting this cultural cycle. But when we think about, so as, as a psychologist, most of the time what psychologists do is they study this part of the inner individuals. Sometimes we study interactions. But really until pretty recently, we didn't really consider the person in the interaction in the institution that they were currently embraced in, and then how that institution was driven by sets of ideas. And that's a powerful understanding, especially if you are trying to change an organization, a program, right? Because what it tells you is you can't just change one idea. You have to think about how that idea is situated in the practices and policies that make up the institution and how that policies and practices dictate how people interact in that context and how that interaction dictates how people feel. And so making change and making it sustainable is always much more difficult than we think. Fine, just don't say that. Just don't do this. Just don't, right? But the don'ts don't help. It's truly about then what are you going to embrace to make that difference. And so when we think about, in the work that we do, all of the conceptual pieces that, fill, that fit in here, we really come back to, if you start to think about America, right, those core cultural ideas boil down to things like independence, individual rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the American dreams. Those are core ideas that drive often how people think what is good, what is right, what is moral in this society. But, right, in many ways, those are a creed of what we mean society to be. They're not a reflection of actually how society works. And so we build institutions and we build rules and ways of being. So in universities, universities are all about making individuals independent. We give you more choices than you could ever imagine and we expect you to enact those choices. And the longer you spend at a university, the idea is the more of an independent individual you will become, an independent thinker, someone who self-expresses, someone who makes choices, gives choices, right? And in fact, one of the most powerful pieces of having a college education is not only do you get more choices, you get to give more choices. And you get to have a voice. And all those subtleties we start to take for granted because most people don't experience the world that way. And so as you keep going, right, you start to see the ways in which all of these features are connected. And what I want to talk about are some of the small, subtle things we can do to make change. But I want to end by really focusing on what it means to make that change sustainable. So. Inherent in all of these cultural systems, right, are a set of ideas and images, what we refer to as social representations. So social representations are systems of values, ideas, and practices that have a twofold function. They help us to orient ourselves in the world, and they help us to communicate with one another. Now we're getting to the nitty gritty, right, because this is that piece. What's good? What's not good? What's represented? What's not represented? And so when we think about all of this, right, what we're talking about is social representations up and down the schema. And yet, most of them taken for granted. The assumption being that they just are good. And so I just want to read you a few 
pages from a children's book. This was one of the most read children's book in the 1970s. I'm going to read you only my favorite pages. <laughs> and, I, and then I'm going to spare you the rest. Boys fix things. Girls need things fixed. Boys invent things. Girls use what boys invent, right? Right? So upsetting, right? But here's the thing. When it comes to scientists, when it comes to builders, there's still a huge gender discrepancy in this country. Why is the National Science Foundation so focused on women and STEM? Because we're still here. We haven't changed as much as we should have. But we haven't in part because change is hard. It's embedded in little things like a children's book. Right? I think all the time about my six-year-old daughter, right, and the messages she gets, and how badly I want her to push back against all of those messages. Right? Because she's got a double whammy. She's both a girl and Native American. And so she's constantly asking me. I mean, just last night in the car, she said, Mom, so we were talking about England, and the English people brought, they, they brought English, the language. Why do we speak English? So try explaining colonization to a six-year-old, <laughs> right? But I love that she's there, but I worry that she could get bogged down in it. In it. And that's the reality for a young child. And so when we think about these representations, the piece that I want to share with you today is the way in which they become our model of self. So we all have in our head an idea of what it means to be a good, moral, or right self. All of us do. The very poor, the very rich, right? What changes is how the environment scaffolds those different ways of being. And so most of our attention gets focused in, in most of our institutions towards that middle class, European American, male. And I absolutely don't mean this to make anyone here feel uncomfortable, because that's not actually what it's about. It's about understanding the ways in which some of those social identities afford you certain social representations. So in the same way that my daughter is going to have to look harder for those representations, the young boys in her class, the young white boys in her class, the world looks different to them. Because we all engage in this process of saying, what's me and what's not me? So let's talk about how we get these models of self. Right, so there are these ideas about what's good. They give form and direction to individual experience. Right, I gave you the example of this growing up on the reservation, being a tribal person, and my motivation being driven by the idea, the expectation that I will give back. Cultural models exist in the head and in the world. Right, So they are in that space between us. They're on the wall. They're literally in the air that we breathe, in the ideas and thoughts that we have. So there are two common models. And what I like about these models is I want you to think for a second about working in diverse environments. Right? One of the difficulties about diverse environments is that we can't possibly know everything about what it means to be black, Latino, native, educated native, not educated native, poor native, rich native, female native, male, native, but what we can understand is that each of those identities comes with a different understanding of self. And when we understand that people have different ways of being, and we can learn to legitimate multiple viable ways of being, we change the environment that people walk in. So the independent model of self is the understanding of self is independent from others in the social context. So good actions promote separation from others and individual self-expression. This is what it looks like. If you are independent, literally, from the time you are born, somebody is giving you choices. You're an infant, and someone's holding out a blue ball 
and a red ball and saying, do you want red or blue? You're just a baby. You don't know. You just want the ball. But nonetheless, when you take it, right, this is that mutual constitution. <gasps> she likes red. And then we start buying you red everything. <laughs> right? I mean, we literally engage in this process of raising children, of cultivating a little agentic self. And this little agentic self gets choices, not real choices, right? You can sit at the table and eat your broccoli for the rest of the night, or you can eat your broccoli, have dessert, and go watch TV. Is it a real choice? No. But the illusion of choice is about developing that sense of agency. And so when we think about this child, right, this child who's being so carefully cultivated, right, this child grows up believing that they should have choices, that they should speak out, that they should speak up if there's a wrong, right? So there's, you start to feel this, right? There's this independence. And with this independence comes a psychological self. This is my physical being right here. This is me, right? This is the boundary of who I am. This is me. This is my space. You don't even have the right to get in my space. Let's be certain, right? Getting in my space gives me the right to defend my space. That is independence. That is an understanding of individual self and way of being that is very much cultivated by American society. Now, other ways of being, which actually are much more common around the world, including low income, white, African American, Native American, Latino, we all do it in different ways. But what we know is that the nature of that relationship is different and it changes. And even within that, right, if we think about different, like my daughter, who's a native girl but has a mother with a PhD, she's not going to look like the other kids on our reservation. She could read at four. Most kids on our reservation don't have books. Right? We have to read for homework for school every night. Last night she read an article because we were out shopping. She read in the car an article from BBC. She's six. That's having a mother who has a PhD who's read to her every day of her life. So that's an interesting integration of middle class values and yet she's very identified with being native. How do you take that? Do you say then that she's not native? No, because she also has a very strong interdependent self. Right? She understands that she is in relationship with others and that herself is in some psychological way overlapping with both her tribal community, her family, right? and she can define herself through those people and through those identities in a different way. But she is going to be different. Right? My cousin says I'm making her weird. <laughs> OK, it, it might possibly be true. But nonetheless, right? that's my cousin's only lived on the reservation view of my daughter who asked questions about anthropomorphism and you know, these weird things. Right? But it's because I've always loved I love words. I love them. So when she asks a word like, what's innate? I'm like, oh, that's a great word. Right? Her mom is a nerd. <laughs> she is going to be different. This model allows for that difference. It doesn't take away from you. I want you to see her as native. I want you to see where she's come from. But it allows us to think about people in a different way. So understanding of self right, as interdependent with others in the social context, in relationship. Independence requires a relationship. So I want you to be really careful here. You don't get choices without someone giving you choices. So both require a relationship. They are different relationship styles and ways of being. So good actions promote connection to others and attentions to others' pre preferences. So when we think about creating identity safety today, I'm going to show you 
one study with university administrators. And what I want to show you is the way in which our administrators across the country acknowledge the, the cultural norms that we set up in universities. How that influences first generation college students. And I'm also going to do a little section on Native Americans because I could do Latinos, I could do African Americans, but I want to focus in part because of the invisibility and yet in Washington, Washington has the fifth largest population of Natives. We are not a tiny group here. And so I would like to just make sure that that stays in your mind when you leave today. Okay, so American Indian and European American. So here's what we get. We did a study where we asked university deans and administrators to write about what were the norms, culture, like that are supported by the university. We also gave them some examples of where we put independence and interdependence in contrast and made them choose. Um, so 71% of university administrators characterize the university as purely independent. 20% characterize them as equally independent and interdependent. And when we broke that down by people of color, that happened to be more people of color administrators. And then 9% characterize their university as interdependent. And those were largely people of color. And so in the second study, and, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because I think the story is easy to follow. But we looked at this independence and interdependence of Native American and European American high school students attending the same high school. And what we were interested in is how their model of self related to their performance in school. And so, right, we used the independence interdependence measure. We used a trust measure in part because Native like trust is a big issue, and that helps to define the kinds of relationships you would have. And then we measured grades. And so just to quickly show you, right, some of the things we expected for American Indians, they were higher in um, interdependence and independence. And what was really exciting about this, right, you might think that's problematic, not for me, uh, because we actually looked closer at the scale. Independence for natives, the questions are knowing who you are, and part of being native is knowing who you are. And that part of in independence for natives actually connects to interdependence. But just as we would have expected for European Americans, they were much higher in independence than interdependence. Now what's interesting is across the board, European American high school students were more trusting of every domain. That's not surprising. But what's interesting is that the model holds. So the best predictor of grades for European American high school students was how independent they were. So, so the better job your parents did making you this independent self, guess what? The better you did. Well, guess what? The, these students are in the same environment, but the opposite model holds for natives. They need to be interdependent. The more interdependent they were, the better they did, which actually in this case also meant if they were female and native, they did better. There wasn't a place for a relationship for native men. Therefore, they didn't feel the interdependence. They didn't have it supported in that environment. And they did not do well. And then trust was a big factor. So we started playing with these, could we do little things to change it for natives? And so one of the things we played with were just these cultural reframings. And I'm going to be honest, I got the idea from a teacher. So there was a teacher who said to me, Stephanie, I have these students that I love, these Native kids, and I tell them all the time how much education will help them in the future. And it just doesn't motivate them. And I said, hmm, what would happen if you told them it would motivate, it would help their family or their community? So we've tried, and I'm just going to show you one example where we reframe education in a study for Native kids. So they're always given a gender-relevant role model, right? So it, I'm sorry, yes, meaning that when they're given the role model, they're always the same gender. So we're holding gender consistent. But they're either white or Native, and they're either told that getting an education is good for you or getting an education is good for your community. 
and we get almost a 25% bump in motivation. Right, these are little things, right? This is just a reframing of the environment. It's how you talk to someone, it's how you understand them. So we do the same kind of thing, right? And here you can kind of see all the benefits for European, American, European Americans of being that independent self, right? It's a tool to get ahead in life, de developing autonomous thinkers, individual competition and achievement are valued, right? So all these ways help them. Well, for Native students across the literature, what we find is that education is a tool to help family and community. Learning occurs in interaction with others. Social support, role models, mentorship are important parts of that trusting relationship. Well, guess what? This holds the same for first-generation college students. So, first of all, we know that first-generation college students, right, have more difficulties in college. They get lower grades, they have higher dropout rates, they have smaller academic gains the first year, they experience less satisfaction in the environment, lower feelings of belonging, few, fewer close relationships, right? Fewer relationships with professors. Well, guess what, right? We also know that one of the things that's different about them is they come from working class backgrounds. They often, when we look at LaRoe's work, right, they lack middle class capital. And they only lack it because you only know what you know, right? And so they engage in cultural models of self that do not match. So we did this study, right, and just so you know, we define first gens where both parents do not have a college degree. So when you look at some of the economics, you, the biggest gain you see in scaffolding happens when you have one parent who has a college degree. So first gens have neither parent has a college degree. Okay, so compared to middle class, people with working class contexts have, make lower incomes, have less geographic mobility, in part because you don't move if you don't have, like you go to college, you move. Then you get a job and you move. Right? People who, st who don't go away to college often stay. And so they have more interactions with their family they also engage in different parenting styles. So in, low, in working class families, you're more likely to teach your child to fit in and to engage, but you do it because, here's the thing, if you don't have money, you don't have a safety net. So your kid gets in trouble, how are you gonna protect that kid? An upper class, middle class kid gets in trouble, you hire a good lawyer, you have ways to protect them. So there's a lot of fear engaged in parenting when you are a poor parent, right? But the idea is also different of parenting, right? There's this concerted cultivation that goes into middle class parenting, right? We're micromanaging children. For working class parents, that story looks very different. It's not about it. There's more of a sense of you're gonna fit in, you're gonna be part of things, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, more and more we're looking at all the advantages that brings to how people think about getting along in the world. So you have jobs with limited autonomy. Okay, so what I wanna show you is that we did, um, we collected data from all students entering Stanford before they arrived on the college campus. It was a unique opportunity. And in, Stanford had just developed a policy where they guaranteed tuition, so we had a lot more first-generation college students who could come to Stanford because Stanford would cover their tuition. So we had 262 first-generation college students, and what we did is we collected information about what motivates them to go to college. And so what we found is that for, for first continuing generation students, the types of things that motivated them were more independence-based, becoming an independent thinker, exploring potential, learn more about interests, and so on, right? And for the first gens, they also f express that value, just not as much as continuing gens did. But what they did express much more was to bring honor to my family, to be a role model, to show others we can do well, give back to the community. Well, in fact, we followed these students for two years, and their motives held and predicted their grades two years later. So the more independent 
their motives were coming into Stanford predicted their grades two years later. So then we worked with Stanford to see if we could actually manipulate their welcome letter. So the original welcome letter for Stanford is very independence-based. Sounds a lot like this. I'm delighted that you have decided to attend Stanford University and that you think Stanford is the right place for you. For the next few years, you will have many opportunities to explore new areas and to learn from our superb faculty and from your own personal exploration and individual experience as a student. Well, we changed the letter to add interdependence. Right? I'm delighted that you and your family have decided that you should attend, and for the next few years, together with the Stanford community, you will have many opportunities to explore. Right? So we included that sense. What we had them do, so we, we actually did this through resident life, so we told them that you know, this is an activity we often have students do. And here's what's interesting, is that when we included interdependence, the achievement gap changes for first-generation college students. Not only did they perform better, but they experienced the task as being less difficult. Wow. And so, lest you think this is a Stanford phenomenon, we then did it with the <laughs> University of Arizona. And guess what? We have exactly the same finding. And they also experience the task as easier. And so, I'm going to end by saying that People sometimes take for granted the subtle ways in which learning and working environments are set up. For example, many environments privilege individual motivation, even when a team of collaborative focused motivation would be more advantageous. A work environment that focuses on independence advantages some and inadvertently disadvantages others. These environments can easily be changed. And integrating interdependence in the environment has advantages for groups that are traditionally underrepresented in workspaces, but most importantly, they do not disadvantage the people who are already there. Right? So it's not a, a give or take, you know, one wins, the other doesn't. And so I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm over time, so I, I wanna stop to honor the Q&A time. But, you know, I just want you to keep in mind that in the work that you do, it is very important to understand that there is no one kind of person. People are products of the environment they grow up in. Cultures change over time. Please get that because I'm not an 18th or 19th century native. I don't live in a longhouse. I don't, you know, I didn't buy these clothes just to come here today, right? Um, and, and we have to allow for differences in ways of being. And so most importantly, Judge lightly and slowly. Thank you. Oh.